In this video, we are going to prove the very infamous Lagrange's theorem. Uh, Lagrange's theorem actually has a lot of different versions you could say, because when one gives a name to a theorem, the idea is that this is a sort of a big deal. We want to be able to reference this in the future. And so you could be like, theorem 6.2.1 in this lecture series, math 4220 for, you know, we could try to reference it internally to the textbook or the course we're in, but what happens when the term is over, the semester's over, you get a different book or whatever, no one's going to be referencing these numbers all the time. A theorem that's important needs a name. And oftentimes it's named after a mathematician who either originally proved it or more often than not who originally published it. Uh, you know, it's not always the case that the name is is the right name, right? I mean, Fermat gets named, or lots of theorems are named after Fermat for which I don't know if he can be proven to have proved, I don't know if he proved any of them, who knows? He certainly did not prove uh, his so-called last theorem. Uh, but, of course, he was right that the proof would not fit inside the margin. So I'll give Fermat a little bit of credit in that regard, I suppose. But Lagrange's theorem is a very important theorem for group theory. Uh, particularly, it's useful in finite group theory. And so what I'm trying to say is when referencing a theorem, if it has a name, it's a big deal. You should know it. But also, when it comes to a theorem with a name, there oftentimes will be many corollaries that follow said theorem. And each and every one of those theorems might actually be referenced as Lagrange's theorem. So in this video alone, we are going to prove Lagrange's theorem, as we have stated here on the screen. And we're also going to prove three corollaries to Lagrange's theorem very quickly. And in the future, if I ever need to use any one of those four results, I will refer to it as Lagrange's theorem, not the corollary of Lagrange's theorem. And this is because Lagrange's theorem is not necessarily a unique statement in group theory. It's sort of an idea of theorems. And so anything connected to what you see now on the screen is often referred to as Lagrange's theorem. So what we're going to do, are the, the version of Lagrange's theorem we're going to prove, is that imagine we have a finite group, which uh, we have a finite group G, and we have a subgroup H. We are going to prove that the order of G is equal to the order of H times the index of H inside of G. Now, I want to point out to you that the word finite here could be dropped, and this statement would still be true. Um, it would then, we'd have to adapt the proof, though, and start talking about some infinite cardinals and things like that, which, although we can do, um, it's a, it goes a little bit beyond the scope of this uh, undergraduate sequence in abstract algebra. So we're going to prove it just for finite groups, for which case we've basically already proven it. The proof goes by the following. G is partitioned by left cosets. We've argued before that cosets form a partition of a group. Uh, left cosets or right cosets, doesn't matter which one you want to use. The G is partitioned by the left cosets. So that's the first part. So what that means is that G is going to look like a disjoint union of all these cosets. Like so. So it's going to be a union of all of these cosets. And so we want to find some, we don't necessarily want to repeat cosets. Uh, so what we want to do is the, basically the following. You often get something called a transversal. A transversal is going to be here a set of representatives, representatives of all the distinct cosets. Okay, so for example, if we looked at a previous example that we've done here, take for example the group Z6 with the subgroup H, uh, which is a cyclic subgroup generated by three. Uh, we saw that there were uh, there were three cosets in that situation. There was H, there's one plus H, and there's two plus H. So as a transversal of these cosets, we could take the set 0, 1, and 2. So that's, that's an example of a coset, a, a transversal of a coset, excuse me. Uh, if we take the group S3 and we take H to be the alternating subgroup, then we have like H and 1, 2, 3 we could take as a transversal. We often like to take the identity as a transverse, inside the transversal. So 1, one, one and 1, 2, 3 would be such an example. Um, uh, and then in contrast, if we take the, if we take the, subgroup this time to be K, then we have three cosets. And so we could take as a transversal uh, the identity, one, two, three, and one, three, two. Those would all be examples of transversals we could do. All right. 
So that's what one means by a transversal. So G is a union of all of these partitions for which if we take G from elements of a transversal, then there's, there's gonna be no overlap whatsoever because notice that G H intersect G prime H is gonna be the empty set so long as G and G inverse disagree with each other. Assuming we take elements from the same transversal, of course, if G and G prime represent the same co coset, they'll actually be equal. So that's the thing is when you intersect cosets together, one of two things happens. You're either going to get the empty set or you're going to get that they're actually equal to each other, depending on whether it's the same coset or not. Cosets do not overlap at all unless they overlap entirely. That's what it means for the cosets to form a, uh, they form a partition. So I'm going to get this stuff off the screen right now. So G is a disjoint union of all of the cosets. So you're going to have something like the following. G, G is going to look like G1H, union G2H, union, you know, all the way down to, uh, say, GTH, where G1, or GI here is just an element of this transversal T. But each and every one of these cosets has the same size. Each of these cosets, G1H, you know, GIH is going to equal GJ. H, all of these cosets have the same have the same cardinality. And so because of that, we gonna, we're going to see that the order of G, it's going to look like, well, it's the sum of the size of all of these part to all of these cosets. But as each of these cosets has the same thing, this is just going to give us some number times the order of H. But how many, what's the number there? Well, the number turns out to be how many cosets do we have? And that's exactly what the index says right here. So we make this argument using finite groups right here, but essentially this argument becomes the same even with infinite sets. I want you to be aware that there's really nothing in this proof that actually requires that things be finite. Um, the reason that people mostly say finite here is that oftentimes this equation is rewritten in the following way, that the index of a group is equal to the order of G divided by the order of H. And that's where things can get a little bit funky if you use infinite numbers. But this proof is actually perfectly acceptable for an infinite group right here, because this could be made into an infinite sum. Um, uh, because it came from an infinite union, which again, we don't, we don't have to worry about that too much. In particular though, if G can be, the order of G can be factored as H times the index of H, then that means that the order of H divides the order of G. And that's the critical takeaway from the Grange's theorem. The order of a subgroup must divide the order of G. Now let's look at those corollaries I promised you here. Suppose that G is some finite group. Again, this word isn't really necessary in this case, but it mostly just comes down to the division. So we'll keep it infinite or keep it finite here. Let little g be the element of that. Then that means that the order of an element divides the order of G. In particular, if you take an element to the order of the group, you're always going to get back the identity. Now I'm not saying the order of little g is the order of the whole group, uh, but if you bring if you raise an element to any multiple of its order, you'll get the identity. And as the order of little g divides the order of capital G, that means capital G is a multiple of little g. And so the argument is a quick, immediate consequence of Lagrange's theorem we just saw a moment ago. Let's say the order of capital G is n, and let's say the order of little g is m. And let's form the cyclic subgroup generated by little g. Well, the order of the cyclic subgroup will equal the order of the element itself. And by Lagrange's theorem, the order of a subgroup divides the order of the whole group. So m divides n. So therefore, there's some integer k such that km equals n. And therefore, if you take g to the n, which is the order of capital G, this is g to the km, which is equal to g to the m to the k, which is e to the k, which is e to the identity. It's that simple. Um, the order of an element is the order of a cyclic subgroup, and therefore, it will divide the order of the group. All right. Suppose, for example, that g has prime order then if a group has prime order, then I actually claim that it's cyclic. And in fact, every non-identity element is a generator of that group. So groups of prime order are always gonna be cyclic. This is our first of, this is gonna be our first classification theorem. That is, can we classify groups up to certain types? And every group of prime order has to be cyclic. It's an immediate consequence of Lagrange's theorem. So take an element of G and let's say that it's order is n. 
Well, by Lagrange's theorem, the order of an element must divide P. But P is a prime number, so there's only two options. N is either 1 or it's P. Well, if N is equal to 1, then the order of G, if that's 1, that means it's the identity. The cyclic subgroup generated by the identity, of course, is just the trivial subgroup itself. All right, well, what if the order is P? Well, if the order uh, if, of G is P, well, P with the order of the whole group, capital G, and therefore that means the cyclic subgroup generated by G has to be the whole group, and therefore G is cyclic, like we just argued a moment ago. So for groups of prime order, they're always cyclic, and anyone who's not the identity must generate the entire group. This divisibility condition is extremely powerful for finite groups. And so let's do our last corollary. We're proving these corollaries in like 30 seconds flat. Suppose we have two groups, two subgroups, H and K. Uh, these are finite, these are, these are subgroups inside of G right here. And let's say we have a chain of subgroups. So K is inside of H and H is inside of G. Now, of course, by transitivity, K is a subgroup of G, but particularly K is a subgroup of H. So then it turns out we can factor, we can factor the index of K as the product of the index of H inside of G and the index of K inside of H. All right, so the index factors that way. Now, this is the first result for which we really are gonna focus on the finite, right? Um, now, the previous result, the corollary, well, sure, if you prime order, the group has to be finite, that's true. Uh, on this one right here, if the order of an element dividing the order of G, that doesn't really mean much if G was an infinite group because everything divides infinity, so to speak. One has to be a little bit more careful because uh, you have to start talking about the torsion group, subgroup, and things like that. Um, that's that. So that one gets a little bit murky. We can make it into an infinite statement, but that's not something we're going to do right now. And then, like I said, the original proof of Lagrange's theorem we did in this video so far, it did not require finite condition whatsoever. Really, the whole business about finite is really going to come right here. That this proof, I do want to mention that this result is true for, for infinite. We can remove the word finite right here and it would still be true. But the proof is going to fundamentally change. And again, without getting into the infinite cardinals that I predicted, uh, we're just going to stick with a finite proof right here. Because the finite proof is pretty nice. It goes like the following. By Lagrange's theorem, the index of K inside of G will be the order of G divided by the order of K. Then, as this is just a fraction, a rational number, we can times by a strategic number one. We're going to times it by the order of H over the order of H, which then we can basically factor this thing. You're going to get G over H, which is the index of H inside of G. And then you're going to get H over K, which is the index of K inside of H. And so the factorization follows immediately from the fact that Lagrange's theorem told us that the index of G and H is equal to the order of G divided by the order of H. And so this gives us Lagrange's theorem with its important corollaries. And again, in the future, I might reference any of these corollaries equally as well as Lagrange's theorem. But when one talk about Lagrange's theorem, you're typically meaning that the order of a subgroup is gonna divide the order of the group. And in those things that are very much related to that principle, we refer to as Lagrange's theorem. Before ending this video, though, I did want to make one comment about the converse of Lagrange's theorem. So Lagrange's theorem says that the order of a subgroup must divide the order of G. That is, the order of a subgroup is a divisor of G. The converse of Lagrange's theorem would be interested in the following. Is every, does every divisor of G have a subgroup of that size? And we saw that for cyclic groups, that thing is true, that every there's, there's a subgroup for every divisor of the order of a cyclic group. But that's not true in general. If you, for example, take the alternating group A4, it has an order of, well, that should be 4 factorial divided by 2. Just so we're clear, 4 factorial is 24. And so you're going to get 12. What are the divisors of 12? You're going to get 1, you're going to get 2, you're going to get 3, you're going to get 4, you're going to get 6, and you're going to get 12. These are the divisors of 12. Now, of course, A4 does have a subgroup of order 1. It's the trivial subgroup. It has a subgroup of order 12. It's called the whole group, A4. Um, it does also have an, it has a subgroup of order 2. Um, for example, you can take the subgroup generated by 1, 2, and 3, 4. If you take a 2, 2 cycle, uh, its order will be 2. Uh, we have a subgroup of order 3. For example, if you take the cyclic subgroup generated by a 3 cycle, which is an even permutation, that'll be 3. Um, it does also have a subgroup of order 4. Uh, this coincides with the Klein 4 group. 
you take the sick, uh, you take the subgroup that contains the identity and all of the two two cycles. Uh, let's see, two four, and then two. We want one four, and then two three. So we have the Klein four group. This is a group of order four. But search as you might, it is impossible to, have to construct a group of order six inside of a four. So although six is a divisor. There is no subgroup of A4 of order 6. And I'm not going to supply the argument of this right now. Actually, I think it would be a great idea for the viewers to try to think about it. Why can't A4 have a subgroup of order 6? It doesn't, it's not going to happen. Basically, the way you'd have to do it is you'd have to combine, you'd have to take a group that contains a 3 cycle and a 2-2 two -two cycle. That's kind of like the only hope of constructing a subgroup of order 6. But then you can show that any such subgroup actually generates the whole group. Um, and so as you, when you try to get six, you actually get 12. So the converse of Lagrange's theorem does not hold. Just because a group order has a divisor does not mean it has a subgroup of said size. Uh, that does not hold in general.